when you ask two archbishops to talk about the same topic, you run the risk of them sort of running into each other. I thought they were amazingly complimentary and powerful, and Cardinal Will got us off to a great start. President DeJoya, Amy uh, is, we wouldn't be here without Amy and GHR. This is one of the uh, sessions I have been most looking forward to. I am fact deprived. And this is a session where we have asked a number of experts that I can't see uh, to tell us what we ought to know about polarization in our church and country and do it in a short time in a way that uh, we can learn and remember. And from the very beginning, Tricia Bruce was one of the people who has both expertise and knowledge uh, and relationships in this. Uh, Tricia is from Maryville College. Uh, she has lots of degrees. What I found really interesting is she plays the guitar and is a folk singer. So un unfortunately, there will not be time for that. But uh, tonight, maybe. Uh, and uh, we have, she's going to introduce our panel, but it's just remarkable to have Kara Pugh and Cato. I just want to say before turning it over to uh, Tricia, there are several people who were a big part of us getting here who are not here. And one is uh, Mary Ellen Cor Cornechny, I can never say that right, uh, who uh, was in Notre Dame. And she uh, and uh, Charlie Comacy were with Tricia, a big part of the Notre Dame. Uh, the conference that we are building on. Uh, uh, Mary Ellen passed away, sadly, while, during the planning process. Uh, Charlie Comacy is uh, not here for another much better reason. They just had a new baby. And uh, for some reason, he thought being with a two-week-old two baby was more important than being with us. I just don't un understand this. Two other people, uh, we're very glad to have Bishop Coyne with us. Uh, Bishop Murray, uh, who, as you know, is uh, facing a health challenge, called and said he could not come. The word yesterday was the reports from the hospital are good. And uh, Bishop Flores was going to be with us, and he had a problem come up in the archdiocese. So. Uh, as we move forward, uh, let's be very grateful to the people who got us here, and let's remember the people who wanted to be here who couldn't be here. And with that, I turn it over to Tricia. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon and welcome. An interesting new article from Science Magazine examined polarization through the lens of a distinctive American tradition, Thanksgiving dinner. It's a creative study. They used smartphone location data, which might be slightly disturbing, and precinct level voting to look at Thanksgiving dinners in 2016 and see how long those dinners lasted. And it turned out that if the hosts and the guests were from opposing precinct districts, meaning that what the guest precinct had voted one way and the host the other, their dinners were shorter. <laughs> In fact, as much as 50 minutes, almost an hour shorter. Uh, nationwide, the authors wrote, 34 million hours of cross-partisan Thanksgiving dinner discourse were lost in 2016 owing to partisan effects. We heard earlier today about the value of gathering together, perhaps even over a meal, to share and talk about difference and things that, are, that matter. Uh, one of the goals of this meeting, of course, is to, have a, to model dialogue that is rooted in truth and love. We social science, scientists are in the business of uncovering one form of truth. Using good sampling and careful methodology, social scientists take a temperature of sorts. We try to name the problem. Uh, similar to the, the, the subheading, the subtitle of the book that came out of the Notre Dame conference that John mentioned, Naming the Wounds and Beginning to Heal. Social scientists ask, does polarization exist? Where? How? What are the divides? Does it differ across time, across generation, across region, across racial group? Empirical data doesn't always produce the kind of data that we feel comfortable with, but it produces the kind of data that we need in order to have this fruitful conversation together. 
Today we have the privilege of hearing from three temperature takers, if you will, three social scientists. I will introduce all three now and then turn it over to each of them to provide some data on polarization as, as it occurs both in our church and in our nation. Gregory Smith is an associate director of research at Pew Research Center. He helps coordinate the center's domestic polling on religion. He writes reports and provides information to news media and others about religion and public opinion, religion and American politics, and the political views of Catholics. He is an author of the 2007 and 2014 Pew U.S. Religious Landscape Studies, among others, as well as the book Politics in the Parish. Smith holds a doctorate in government from the University of Virginia. We also have with us Mark Gray a research associate professor and senior research associate at the Center for Applied Research in the Apostolate, CARA, here at Georgetown, where he directs the CARA Catholic Polls. He has a PhD in political science from the University of California, Irvine, and has published on a wide number of topics related to Catholic parishes, religious switching, Catholic schools, and politics. He has designed, led, or participated in CARA research projects, including the National Survey of Catholic Parishes and Emerging Models of Pastoral Leadership. He is also the editor of a great blog hosted by CARA called 1964. We also have with us Emily Eakins. She is a research fellow and director of polling at Cato Institute. Her work focuses on public opinion, American politics, political psychology, and social movements. She is the author of Policing in America, The Libertarian Roots of the Tea Party, and Public Attitudes Toward Federalism. Before joining Cato, Eakins directed polling for the Reason Foundation and worked as a research associate at Harvard Business School. She has appeared on Fox News, Fox Business, and her research has been cited in numerous publications. She holds a PhD also in political science from the University of California, Los Angeles. Thank you for being here, and we'll first hear from Dr. Smith. All right, well thank you and good afternoon everybody. It's a real pleasure to be here with all of you and to be a part of these important discussions that you're having. Um, I know that we're here to discuss polarization in the United States and I'll talk today about some polarization that we see in the American Catholic Church. But I'd like to begin by pointing out that Catholics have a lot in common with each other in terms of their understanding of what it means to be Catholic in terms of their commitment to the church, and in terms of their admiration for Pope Francis. That said, our data do show that Catholics are deeply politically divided, and those partisan political divisions get carried right over to the way Catholics view a host of social and political issues, and uh, even, on, even in cases where the church has staked out its own clear position. Before I get to that, I want to say just a couple of words about Pew Research Center. We're an independent, nonprofit, nonpartisan research organization. We do a lot of different kinds of research, not only about religion, but that's what I focus on in my work. Um, the main point I want to make here is that we take a very strict non-advocacy stance. We do not take positions on any political or religious issues. And that can sometimes put us in something of an odd spot in presentations like this, because it means that we cannot suggest strategies to nonprofits, to religious leaders, or to others. I cannot, for example, offer strategies on how to overcome polarization in the United States through Catholic social thought. Um, <laughs> But with that said, we do hope that our research can be helpful and informative to leaders like those in this room who, uh, who need the information to make good decisions. Now, onto the data, which I'm going to go through very quickly, but don't worry, I will make all of this available after the presentation. Um, as I mentioned, there are lots of things that unite Catholics in the United States. For example, nearly all Catholics say that working to help the poor and needy is essential or at least important to what it means to be Catholic. Similarly, our data show that 9 in 10 or more Catholics say that having a personal relationship with Jesus, believing in the resurrection, receiving the sacraments, and devotion to Mary are all important elements of what being Catholic means to them personally. Most Catholics also tell us that they are quite dedicated to the church. When we ask directly, could you ever imagine yourself leaving the Catholic Church? 
Seven in 10 American Catholics say, no way. We're here for the long haul. I could never imagine myself leaving the church. And as I mentioned, US Catholics are united in their admiration for Pope Francis. In our most recent polling from earlier this year, fully 84% of American Catholics say they have a favorable view of Pope Francis. I've heard John say that any American politician would kill for that kind of, <laughs> uh, uh, of approval rating, and I think that's true. You can also see here that upwards of 9 in 10 Catholics say they believe that Pope Francis is compassionate and humble. So there is a lot that unites American Catholics. But that's obviously not the whole story. We wouldn't be here today if that was the whole story. There's also a lot that divides Catholics. And, on, and what we see in the data is that on issue after issue after issue, American Catholics are pretty polarized along political lines. This is the recent trend in partisanship among US Catholics. And you can see that Catholics are, on the whole, pretty divided. Um, in our polling in 2017, about half of Catholics said that they identify with or lean toward the Democratic Party, and the other half identify with or lean toward the GOP. If we look just below the surface, we see huge partisan gaps between Catholics from different racial and ethnic backgrounds. Since 2008, White Catholics in the United States have trended strongly in a Republican direction. And currently, more than half of all white Catholics in the United States prefer the GOP to the Democratic Party. Just four in 10 identify with or lean toward the Democratic Party. It's not here on this chart, but I should also point out that that trend, that increasing Republicanism, is especially pronounced among white Catholics who say they attend religious services most often. Uh, white Catholics who attend Mass on a weekly basis are even more strongly Republican than our white Catholics as a whole. Hispanic Catholics, in stark contrast, um, we have a very different picture. Hispanics, of course, constitute a large and growing proportion of all Catholics in the United States. And this is a strongly Democratic constituency. Roughly two-thirds of Hispanic Catholics in our recent polling say they identify with or lean toward the Democratic Party. Now, perhaps those partisan divisions, those differences between white Catholics and Hispanic Catholics, maybe that's not surprising. Maybe most of us were familiar with those kinds of breaks. Um, but I think it's important to illustrate them because of what flows from them. And this might be a little bit more surprising. On a variety of social and political issues on which the church has staked very clear claims, it turns out that American Catholics appear to be guided as much by their partisanship as by their Catholicism. For instance, in the way they think about public policy as it relates to the poor, Catholic Republicans look more like other Republicans than they do like other Catholics. Last year, six in 10 Catholic Republicans told us that they think poor people in the United States have it easy because they can get government benefits without doing anything in return. That is basically indistinguishable from the views expressed by Republicans as a whole. In sharp contrast, 70% of Catholic Democrats say that poor people have hard lives because government benefits don't go far enough to help them live decently. We see the exact same pattern on this question. Like Republicans as a whole, nearly seven in 10 Catholic Republicans say that government aid to the poor does more harm than good because it makes people too dependent on government resources. Two thirds of Catholic Democrats, by contrast, say government aid to the poor does more good than harm because people can't get out of poverty until their basic needs are met. The point I want to emphasize is that Catholic Republicans look pretty much just like other Republicans. And Catholic Democrats look just like other Democrats. There's really nothing, at least in these measures, that's distinctively Catholic about these partisans. We see exactly the same pattern in data about immigration. The big majority of Catholic Democrats say that immigrants strengthen our country because of their hard work and talents. Catholic Republicans aren't so sure. Many of them say that immigrants are a burden on the United States because they take American jobs, housing, and health care. 
And while most Catholic Democrats oppose expanding the wall along the border, the U.S. border with Mexico, most Catholic Republicans favor that public policy approach. These patterns even extend to Catholic attitudes about the environment. Eight in 10 Catholic Democrats, much like Democrats as a whole, say that global warming is caused by human activity. Three quarters of Catholic Republicans disagree, saying instead that global warming is either not caused by human activity or that it's not occurring at all. Now, I realize that in these examples, it could appear to this point that Catholic Republicans are more out of step with the church and the bishops and Pope Francis than are Catholic Democrats. But that is not the case on every issue. When it comes to abortion, for example, Catholic Democrats are the ones who appear out of step with the church. Um, six in 10 Catholic Republicans say that abortion should be against the law in most or all cases. In sharp contrast, seven in 10 Catholic Democrats say that abortion should be legal in most or all cases. And that includes three in 10 Catholic Democrats who say that abortion should be legally permissible in all cases without restriction. Um, on both sides of the political aisle then, in the way they approach social and political issues, Catholic partisans often tend to resemble their fellow partisans more than they do their fellow Catholics. In some ways, we're even beginning to see this partisan polarization carried over into Catholics' views of church matters. For example, we're beginning to see divergence in views of Pope Francis along political lines. The share of Catholic Republicans who say that Pope Francis is too liberal, that was the question wording, too liberal, now stands at 55%. It's more than doubled in recent years. And the share of Catholic Republicans who say they believe Pope Francis is naive has also doubled in recent years from 16% to 32%. While most Catholics from both parties continue to have a favorable view of Pope Francis, the share of Catholic Republicans who have an unfavorable view of him has quadrupled in recent years. And there has been a very dramatic decline in the share of Catholic Republicans who say they think Pope Francis constitutes a change for the better. Today, five years into his pontificate, just 37% of Catholic Republicans say they think Pope Francis represents a major change for the better. That's down from 60% following his first year as Pope. So at least in some ways, Catholics in the United States, I think, can be seen as a microcosm for what's happening in the broader culture. On issue after issue, Catholics are polarized along partisan lines just as is the public as a whole, even on issues on which you might expect Catholics to exhibit a distinctively Catholic approach. But even with all of that in mind, I want to end my remarks by returning to where I began. As divided as they are, along partisan lines on so many important topics, there are important sources of unity within Catholicism. For one thing, Catholic Republicans and Democrats mostly agree on what it means to be Catholic. They agree with each other that having a personal relationship with Jesus, believing in the resurrection, working to help the poor, these are key elements of what it means to be Catholic. And both groups say they're sticking around for the long haul. Seven in 10 in both groups say that no matter what, they could never leave the Catholic Church. Neither Catholic Republicans nor Catholic Democrats appear to be going anywhere. So the discussion you're having, needing now to discuss a way forward, even in the face of pronounced polarization in the country and in the church, is very timely indeed. Thank you for your attention, and I'll look forward to our conversation. So I've got um, different data sources, but a lot of similar things to say uh, as to what uh, Greg just let us see. The first thing that I want to point out is how Catholics vote. And what you're seeing up here on the screen is the share of people of different religions here in the United States voting for the Democratic Party. 
whether it's the midterms uh, or the presidency. And you can see Protestants, they vote Republican in a majority every single time. Jewish voters, those of other religious affiliations, those of no affiliation, vote Democrat strongly every single time. There's one group up here that switches, that sometimes votes Democrat, sometimes votes Republican, and that's Catholics. Um, the, my notion is, is that Catholics are, are somewhat politically homeless in the United States. There's two parties, two choices, and neither of them fit the faith or Catholic social teaching very well, so they're sometimes uh, making very constrained choices. In the 2016 election, you can see the large differences here in terms of race and ethnicity, non-Hispanic white voters voting in a majority for Trump, whereas Hispanic, Latino, and those of other races voting strongly for, for Hillary Clinton. So a divide that we saw in partisanship. And you can see by generation, the older you get, the more likely you were to vote for Trump, and millennials being distinctively uh, different here. So if we think about the traditional way the party system organizes itself in terms of its platforms, the, the policies that it supports, these are our two options as, as Catholics in this country. And you're going to be uncomfortable, hopefully, voting for either one because each of them has positions that are deeply out of step with what the church teaches. In many other countries, there's another option. There's, if you draw a line through that last there, you'll see at the top there's a Christian Democrat party. So if I was in Europe, if I was in Latin America, I would have a political party and a choice that kind of made more sense to me as a Catholic. But that's not available here in the United States, and therefore, again, we have to choose one or the other. And as sociologists would, would say, this is the worst possible situation. To have two groups that are, uh, you know, you've got a dichotomous choice that you're going to have very, very strong in-group, out-group behaviors. And people are going to act irrationally. They're going to become strongly bonded to their political party and like Greg said, I, and I've said publicly and many times before, in the United States, party trumps faith for Catholics. They find a way to fit their partisanship uh, within their religiosity and, and, and can emphasize the issues that are consistent with the church, but then often minimize those that aren't. The other thing that's occurring, I think, over the last decade or so is that politics is becoming more and more like sports. It's becoming more like a fandom. People are taking their partisanship in a whole different direction. Uh, CNN, MSNBC, Fox News, those are sports center for politics. Um, as Pew shows us, there's very little news on those shows every single night. It's all commentary. Um, and people get on it. To, to, it's the red meat that feeds this political machine. Now, I have a slightly different view of, of partisanship and ideology. Uh, I'm taking the leaners out. The way that pollsters do this is they ask people their party identification. And if they uh, uh, say no, that they, they don't affiliate with the party, then they're asked if they lean one way or the other. So I do see a little bit of good news here, that there, there is a large chunks of Catholics who are in those leaners or non-identifying um, non groups. So if you take out the leaners, 42% of Catholics don't identify with a, a party. And then if you look at ideology, most Catholics do not say they are a conservative or a liberal. They're in the middle. There is a rational, reasonable, pragmatic potential here in the middle of the Catholic electorate and population. And it's really at the polls where you have liberal Democrats, conservative Republicans that are strongly wedded to their ideologies and their partisanship. So when we see here in the issues, uh, I see a similar pattern here. There's definitely divides, but there's also some potential for for bridges here. If we look here at, at abortion, uh, abortion questions, whether you consider yourself pro-life, pro-choice, the label doesn't matter as much as the circumstance. So you really have to delve deeply into the type of question asked here. And you can see in this case where people are given four different options that c Catholics are not as polarized as you might imagine. Um, half of Democrats believe that it should be available uh, as a matter of personal choice. Uh, but there are lots of Democrats who are in a different position here. And there are 40% of Republicans who believe that it should only be in the circumstances of rape, incest, or a woman's life is in danger. But again, you've got a lot of Republicans in other parts of, of this graph. And if you pull back the lens a little bit further and look at life issues in general, the top line is, the this is consistent with the church here, um, belief or this is opposition to legal suicide if the person's tired of living. Eight, eight in 10 Catholics say no, that, that shouldn't happen. 
And then if we look at here, abortion, for the woman wants it for any reason. Two-thirds of Catholics say, no, that we don't want that to happen. It's been that way consistently for, for decades. And the good news for the church on the death penalty is it's moving in the right direction. So in the last two decades, Catholics have moved closer to the church in its position opposing the death penalty. However, just with the other circumstances here, uh, assisted suicide if the patient has a terminal uh, illness, um, or an abortion in the case of the woman being pregnant was a result of rape, you can see that there's agreement, uh, much more agreement among Catholics. So when you get down to the specific issue here, people are um, thinking in a way that is much more complex than maybe surveys uh, show at times. Looking at immigration, there's also not, on a couple of these questions, the extreme differences that I think we believe are there if we watch CNN, MSNBC, Fox News, so this question here from the National Election Study says, which comes closest to your view about government policy should be toward unauthorized immigrants now living in the United States? And you can see majorities of Democrats, Republicans, and the unaffiliated, uh, politically unaffiliated here say that they should be allowed to remain and eventually qualify for citizenship if they meet certain requirements. It is true that you've got a quarter of Republicans uh, who are here it, definitely out of step with what the church is uh, teaching or the stances of, of many church leaders in terms of forcing them to go back home. Here's the question about the dreamers. Again, regardless of your party, there's, there's generally a broad agreement here that children brought here um, and who've been here at least 10 years uh, should be allowed to live and work here. Um, it's, uh, again, there's more Republicans in the column there should be sent back home, but most Republicans aren't there. Here's where you start to, to see shifts, and it's really about people from outside of the United States coming in where you see the, the Republicans, Catholic Republicans here being distinctly different. So here's the border wall with Mexico, so consistent with Greg showed you, Republicans and Democrats are on complete different sides here, uh, Republicans favoring, Democrats opposing. Here is, um, do you favor uh, allowing Syrian refugees to come to the United States? Again, very different uh, sides here, 75% of Republicans oppose. Although I would point out that even Democrats here are kind of divided between these three positions here of favoring, opposing, and, or neither. Um, so they're not heavily in opposition in direct polarization, but uh, definitely inconsistent with what church leaders have uh, been saying about refugees. This is uh, the climate change. Again, similar to Greg, you see um, Republicans are much more likely to say that uh, this has some component of natural causes, not entirely human, whereas Democrats are more likely to say it's mostly human activity. However, I will say there is some hope here, because if you look at the, the two columns to the left here, both of these say that human activity is a part of it. It's just what percentage or what amount of it is part of it. And most Catholics, Democrat, Republican, or uh, un, uh, unaffiliated, believe that human activity is part of the cause. Um, here is gun control. And again, as you uh, would imagine, there's polarization. It's kind of the, the topics that are in the news that were a big part of this last campaign. You do see divides between Democrats and Republicans, with Democrats saying that it should become more difficult to buy a gun, whereas Republicans or a majority are saying, um, keep the rules about the same. There are, when you turn to spending on an issue, though, like crime, um, spending on crime, you can see there's no polarization here. There's a broad agreement that the federal spending should be increased. But when you jump to poverty, again, consistent with what you saw in the previous presentation, uh, aid to the poor, federal aid to the poor, Democrats believe that this should be increased, where Republicans are more likely to say either keep it the same or decreased. This is um, an issue about income requiring employers uh, to pay women and men the same amount uh, for the same work. Again, broad agreement. There's no partisan divide here. Um, you know, nine and 10, eight, uh, high 80% regardless of your party. However, when you turn here to uh, do you favor or oppose the government trying to reduce the difference in incomes between the richest and poorest households, you see Republicans opposing it. You see Democrats supporting it. And then finally, when you get here to, to feeling thermometers. So this is how warmly Catholics feel towards these different groups. And you can see Pope Francis, uh, just like Greg had shown, is very warmly seen to be between 0 and 100 degrees here in terms of warmth. As you go across, um, you see rich people and poor people. You see police, Black Lives Matter, conservatives, liberals, big business, and labor unions. 
you can see where you would think Republicans being warmer towards a group that might be part of their coalition or consistent with their uh, ideology. And then you see Democrats, you see the same, uh, same way. So it's not just issues, it even comes down here to affect towards particular groups. So where there's very similar affect, whether you're a Democrat or Republican to Pope Francis, you see much bigger variations uh, for these other groups. So what my story is in terms of looking at the data is that the party is the villain here. The, the two-party system and the, our two political parties and the strong partisanship pushes Catholics away from Catholic social teaching in one way or the other. And it makes, uh, we would think, we would hope it would make for difficult choices, but people seem to be quite comfortable voting with their party in opposition to their church and expressing those attitudes. Uh, so if I could say that if there's any kind of thing that the church could do to help overcome polarization, it's, it's a drinking problem. It's, it's, uh, some of us are drinking red Kool-Aid, some of us are drinking blue Kool-Aid, and if we all tamper down and maybe switch to water, we could, uh, we could have a different conversation. A survey conducted by the Public Religion Research Institute several years ago found that about a third of millennials, or Americans born roughly after 1980, said that they had, um, excuse me, of those who had left the religious tradition of their birth, said they had done so over uh, LGBT issues and the kind of conflict that they saw between their church and LGBT rights. In recent years, we've seen record numbers of people um, leaving organized religion. Since 1992, we've seen a quadrupling of the so-called nuns, those who don't have a religious affiliation, not nuns, N-U-N, but N-O-N-E. <laughs> and we've also seen this trend among conservatives, um, a tripling of uh, people le leaving organized religion among conservative Americans. Much in the political punditry, in pop culture, and entertainment in recent years either explicitly say, or I would argue strongly imply, that religion has become a force for intolerance and marginalization in American society. So when I saw this little bumper sticker, um, there is no war on religion, only opposition to intolerance, oppression, hatred, and stupidity by the Richard Dawkins Foundation, I thought that really fit with kind of a message that you do see pretty prevalent um, in modern media. Um, and given that the lines are often drawn between religious people and non-religious people, for my presentation, I'll be focusing on that as opposed to Catholic versus non-Catholic, as the other presentations have done. So what does the data say? Um, I'm going to actually go back here. Excuse me. Um, so I collected some data as part of the Democracy Fund Voter Study Group. We're going into the field every couple of months or so, polling about 8,000 Americans about important issues um, of the day. Since, and we started this uh, right after the 2016 election. Um, and because of that, we, able, we have a very, very large sample size, and that allows us to look at small subgroups of voters. And so I've been taking a look at um, voters, or in, not just voters, voters and non-voters alike, by their, relig their religious attendance. So this is all religious people and by how often they say they attend religious services. And I've also been looking very carefully at uh, Trump voters. And what we actually find is something very different than what this particular bumper sticker would suggest to you. We actually find that uh, religious attendance serves as a moderating force in our politics. For this presentation, I'm just looking at people who voted for Donald Trump in the 2016 election by how often they attend church. And what I will be showing you today is that the more often that conservative Trump voters attend religious services, the more likely they are to have warmer, more tolerant feelings towards religious and racial minorities, to be more open on immigration, um, uh, be more concerned about poverty and a host of other issues that you might, or at least many people, may not have expected to see correlated uh, with religious attendance. So I'll start here. As you see, um, moving from uh, kind of the left to the right, that is how frequently people attend religious services, and this is just among Trump voters. The more often conservative Trump voters attend religious services, the warmer their feelings towards African Americans. And we see the same trend among Hispanics, going from 53% among secular Trump voters to 70% among very uh, high, uh, conservative Trump voters who attend church very regularly, churchgoers. 
We saw the same thing among Asian Americans. We also see that concerns about racial equality increase uh, considerably as conservative Trump voters um, attend church. Now again, that doesn't mean that these, the, the Trump voters that never return to attend church don't care about it, but we do see some sort of a correlation or a relationship between the two. Church-going Trump voters are more concerned about racial equality than secular Trump voters. When I saw the data put this way, I was really surprised. It just, you know, again, this was within the margin of error, but looking at this, just a slim majority of uh, secular Trump voters say that the issue of racial equality is not an important issue to them. That doesn't necessarily mean that they don't care at all about it, but it's not salient to them. Whereas religious Trump voters, um, people who attend regularly, say that this is something that they care um, a great deal about. We also see that warm feelings increase towards religious minorities among church-going Trump voters. Go, now again, it's not very high to begin with, <laughs> but you can see that there's almost a doubling from secular to regular church-going Trump voters in their attitudes towards Muslims living in the United States going from 16% to 27% who have warm feelings. And the same trend, although much higher to start with, among attitudes towards Jewish Americans, 68% going up to 85% among strong churchgoers. So, um, we also see that uh, church-going Trump voters um, are more likely to say it's very important to accept people of diverse racial and religious backgrounds. Now, to be clear, majorities would say it was either somewhat or very important, but this gives us some measure of salience. How important is this to you? And we see that the more frequently these conservatives attend church, the more likely they are to care about acceptance and diversity. This was an interesting finding, I thought. To what extent is your racial identity very important to you? Now, overall, among white uh, respondents in the survey, not many say that their racial identity is very important to them. However, among secular Trump voters, it was significantly more likely to be important to their, uh, to their identity to be white. So this is just among white Trump voters. We see 26%, about a quarter of these secular Trump voters think that their white racial identity is very important to them compared to 9% of those who attend more than once a week. Switching over to immigration, we also see that church attendance seems to correlate with attitudes on immigration. So we find that um, among secular Trump voters, almost two-thirds support building a wall along the border with Mexico. This declines to 49% among um, conservative Trump voters who attend church regularly. And we also find that opposition to a path to citizenship for unauthorized immigrants living in the United States also declines with, with church attendance. Um, I didn't create graphs for all of them because there's so many, but I'll just kind of give you an overview. We also see that church attendance um, is correlated with attitudes about how hard immigration should be. So people who, um, Trump voters who attend church regular, regularly think that immigration should be easier. It doesn't bother them as much to interact with immigrants who don't speak English, or excuse me, who speak English with an accent. Um, they're less likely to say that illegal immigration is a drain on American society and to say that immigration helps more than it hurts. The travel ban, arguably one of the most important policies that predicted uh, support or voting for Donald Trump in the 2016 election. We see that um, strong support for a temporary travel ban um, seems to drop off among Trump voters who attend church um, very frequently, dropping from 54% among the secular Trump voters to 34% among those regular church goers. We also saw correlation with trade. And the reason why I think this is useful is trade often seems to be related to our attitudes about immigration and globalization and acceptance of kind of a broader community. Um, and so again, we see that reflected here in attitudes towards trade. Regular church going Trump voters are more open to trade with other nations compared to secular Trump voters. Oh, excuse me. Okay. Um, 
We also found that regular church-going Trump voters also are more likely to oppose the death penalty and to say that poverty um, is something that they are really concerned about. So I just threw a bunch of data at you, and I want to kind of process that and kind of unpack that. When I show this to people, a lot of people are very surprised because of the stereotype about religion being a force for tolerance is not something that a lot of people talk about, but clearly we see in the data that among conservatives it tends to be. We don't necessarily see the same relationship among um, Democratic voters, and I think that's part of the reason is that if you took the population as a whole, you might not notice this trend, but if you look among conservative voters, you do. And I think that there are three reasons that we might be seeing th this relationship. So the first might be, the, the obvious one, could be church teachings, that every Sunday, the more, likely, the more you attend church, the more likely you are to, to re be reminded to be accepting of people who are different than you and to have love and compassion for a broader community that we're all God's children, that kind of a, um, those types of teachings. We've also found um, that religious people tend to have a way of forming um, they, they have greater connections to their communities and their neighborhoods. So I'm going to skip past this slide to just one more here. Excuse me. Right here. So we also found that church-going Trump voters are more likely to be sat satisfied with the place that they live their neighborhood, and the family relationships that they have. Um, across a, a variety of dif different things that we asked about, it always seems to be increasing. Um, the social capital is increasing among um, Trump voters who attend church more regularly. It appears as though these individuals have a greater sense of belongingness to a community. And some people have made the argument, and I think this data supports that, that for certain individuals who have a strong desire or need for community and belongingness, which empirically data backs up and shows that conservatives are more likely to score higher on that desire, if they're not receiving that from some sort of kind of from family, neighborhood, or other civil, society, civil institutions like a religious institution, then they redraw the boundaries along um, nationality and race. The, the former are, are, are mutable, or excuse me, are things that you choose. You can choose um, the community that you live in, you can choose your religion and your beliefs, but you don't choose your race and you don't choose the country that you were born in. Um, and so the argument could be that when we draw the lines um, along race and nationality, that can create Obviously, that creates more problems, but religion can be this, this moderating force that redraws those boundaries in a healthier way. Um, we also found that church-going Trump voters were more likely to have a greater sense of personal agency. They don't seem to feel like they are kind of victims of these external forces being, uh, and being acted upon. They're more likely to say they believe they have a say in politics. Um, they're less likely to believe that people take advantage of other people. Um, and, that, and they're less likely to feel that you have to be careful when dealing with other people compared to, tr uh, to secular Trump voters. So it seems like these three things are playing an important, are kind of interacting with each other to perhaps explain how religion has become a moderating force in our politics, particularly among conservative Trump voters. Thank you. We have a very brief opportunity to invite questions from you all. This conversation, of course, will continue into the next panel as well. So we could take perhaps one or two questions in the form of a question. Back in the back, thank you. Hi, I'm Carter Sneed from Notre Dame. Just a, a methodological question. And, and this last presentation gets, in, gets to my question a little bit. What I was hoping, without any evidence, is that people who are more, uh, I guess, religiously observant um, would, would be more countercultural in their views than their respective parties. That is, I mean, you pointed out here, it's, it looks a little bit like more religiously observant voters for Trump are less like the median Republican or secular Trump voter. They're more moderate to put a normative overlay on it. Is that also true of the, of the Democratic voters as well? I, I, is it the case that, that church attendance or something like that as a proxy for observance or belief uh, moderates everybody and, and makes them more countercultural? Yes, that's a great question. If we had more time, I would show you a whole other set of slides among Democratic voters and, and church-going Democratic voters. Yes. So as Democrats attend church more regularly, they take more conservative positions on a lot of different issues, including economic questions. Um, but among conservatives, we see them taking more liberal um, approaches, particularly to the cultural questions. 
Elsie Miranda. Thank you. Elsie Miranda, I'm from Barry University and now the Association of Theological Schools. I wondered in the, in, the, in the questions how Catholics understood Catholic social teaching because uh, after 22 years of teaching at a university, my students think that Catholic social teaching is about anti-abortion, anti-gay, and anti-divorce. And so that leaves out a significant amount of uh, Catholic social teaching and the principles that are not being attended to. So do you know how they understood Catholic social teaching? I, do, I'm, I have, haven't seen a, a, a survey that tries to measure what you're asking. Doesn't mean that it doesn't exist, but um, my, my sense is that, again, that, that party, that Catholics emphasize what they think Catholic social teaching is in, within their partisan frame, and they tend to em understand and emphasize the things that are consistent with their faith, but maybe neglect the others. It's probably the last question here. Uh, Megan Clark from St. John's University. Um, my question is about the relevance of geography, and you may or may not have looked at this in the data. Um, and so some of that is, the, the kind of the easy example is, to what extent do you see a difference in what those numbers look like when you adjust for where it is that people live, and we're talking about uh, Republicans or Democrats who live in cities when it comes to, or on the border, where it comes to immigration and the border wall, or who live on the coasts and the places most affected by climate change on the climate change question. So to what extent, if you've looked at the data, does it paint the same or a slightly different picture? I'm trying to get at kind of to what extent personal experiences would impact that partisanship based on place. Well, just um, quickly, I, have, I haven't looked at detail um, at the link between geography and every question, but um, I will say, and I think this is very consistent with much of Kara's research, that um, what do we know? We know that Catholic partisanship is very closely bound up with race and ethnicity. Not, not determined by it, but very closely connected. We also know that as uh, the share of Catholics who are Hispanics continues to grow, and it will continue to grow, that is serving to shift the geographic center of Catholicism from the Northeast and the Midwest to the South and the West. And so, yes, I, I think just based on that, that there has to be a very strong geographic component to this. I, I think that on average, and not, again, I'm sure that there, there are certainly exceptions, but I think on average, um, Catholic parishes uh, in, the, uh, in the South and the West are going to be different than Catholic parishes in the Northeast and the Midwest, and that's going to be bound up with much of what we've seen here today. A conversation to be continued. Please join me in thanking our panelists.